Hey, this is Gary Gay with the Pragmatic Engineer. I've been an engineer and engineer manager at Uber, working a bunch on the Uber app. And today I'm gonna to answer a question, why is the app so large? Why does it take up more than 300 megabytes of space? What's going on there? Is it just some engineering inefficiencies or people over-engineering things? Or is there a legit reason? And I'm gonna go into the details with specifics with a, with a part of the app that I know very well, which is payments, which is only 10 or 15% of the whole app, but we're gonna walk through on why it takes up so much space and you'll get an idea of what's the reason behind this big size. So when you go into the Uber app, it looks pretty simple. So now on my screen, as I'm going, I can select where I wanna to go to. I have a couple of different ride options. I'm in Amsterdam, so these are the different ones. I can change payment options. I could add some, some different payment methods. I can schedule a ride, and that seems about it. And you're probably thinking, why does this app take up more than 300 megabytes in space? Wow, that's a pretty big app. So I've been working on this app for a bit over four years while I was at Uber. I think I have pretty good answers to this. Let's get into it. So on the home screen of the app, payments is a tiny, tiny part. You can select the type of payment type you want to use. And that's kind of somewhere here on the app itself. So it's not much. Now, when you go into the screen, you get to what is called the wallet screen that my team used to own. So here you have the list of your different payment methods, maybe multiple credit cards or PayPal, that kind of stuff. And you can add a payment method. Now, what most people don't realize is this app payment method will be very different in every single country. So obviously, first you have credit card. Now, credit cards are the most common payment methods typically in Uber, and they have some complexity. You have that screen where you need to enter a different credit card numbers, there are some validations, there might be some checks afterwards. So, you know, I'll say this is a pretty complex screen because it needs to work everywhere in the world. For example, you need to do checks for American Express, which has different number of digits. You have different bin numbers and so on. So there's a lot of business logic behind all of this, uh, both client-side validation and server-side validation. That client-side logic is not negligible. And in terms of complexity, I'll call this a large complexity one. The, the next most common payment method is cash. Maybe you're not using it, maybe you are, but this is across the app everywhere. But there's multiple touch points on, on the app. So there's multiple touch screens. It also has to work with the driver app. And there's a bunch of work that's going into this. And so the complexity of this part is also a large one. There are safety implications in different markets like Mexico or Brazil that you might not even think of, but you need to take care of these things. Another popular payment method is PayPal. And while I was there, PayPal was integrated with an SDK that adds to the actual bundle size. There's also different payment flows that you need to cater for. Uh, it's not too bad, so I'll put the complexity of this as a medium one, because you still need to make it sure that it works across those 60 different countries and the millions of people using it. Now, another very popular payment method is Paytm. You might ask, what, what is Paytm? Well, it's one of the biggest payment methods in India. People rely on this payment method very heavily. And for Paytm, I recall we had an SDK and we had at least 10 different screens. Uh, we supported a native top-up flow. This integration was almost more complex than credit cards, so this is definitely a large complexity. Then there's Apple Pay. On iOS, on Android, there obviously there, there's Android Pay. Integrated, it has some quirks, but it's pretty well documented. I'll put this as a medium complexity. Then we have credit cards in India. So you might think, hold on, do credit cards work differently in India? Yes, they do. You get a second fa factor authentication that can work with different banks. It can work differently. That needs to be integrated into, into the app. It could be a text message. It could be some online interface. And there's a bunch of things that we have to debug. When my team owned this integration, it was a lot of work with this. I'm gonna put the complexity of this as an L, but honestly, it felt sometimes like an extra arch complexity piece. And a lot of people were using this in India. Next one is UPI. What is UPI? It's Unified Payments Interface, a very popular payment method in India. Again, lots of people using it. You're kind of, you might be seeing a theme here. There's a lot of complexity in other sides of the world than uh, you might expect. And the complexity of this integration was also quite large. Uh, and we also had to add an SDK that is in all parts of the app. So even if you're using it in the US or in Europe, you're gonna have this SDK there and there's a bunch of work to be done. Another payment method is Venmo. If you're in the US, you're very familiar with this. This is added via an SDK. 
I'm going to say medium complexity, although it kind of turned into a large one because of some of the launch mechanisms we had. We had a stage rollout. There were some credits that we needed to use uh, behind the scenes with the back end. The mobile needed to know about a, a few different things, but overall it's, it's not too bad. Most of it relies on the actual SDK. Another popular payment method is Brazil Combo Card. This is a very special use case of credit cards. You kind of added the same flow as with credit cards, but after you added it, if we detect that your credit card is in Brazil, meaning your bin, the first few digits of the credit card are for a Brazilian bank, we're gonna have an additional check to, to select if you're using it as a credit or as a debit card. It's a very interesting system. We needed to add support per different banks, uh, later on, you need to be able to change this back and forth. And the complexity of this project was almost a similar complexity to doing credit cards. Maintaining these things, maintaining the bin lists, which are also pushed to the mobile, they're not stored there, we store it on the back end, but the mobile needs to parse it. It's pretty, pretty complex. And a lot of people use it in Brazil, where this is a special type of credit card. Now we're still not done with credit cards because we have things like Amex Rewards. And there's also MasterCard program as well. So when you add credit cards that are in a rewards program with Uber, you get an additional screen where you get more information, you might be able to track your balance, and there's a couple of other complexities, and this also makes it a pretty large complexity uh, to build it, and then later you need to maintain it. Now, some more payment methods. This one you might have come across if you ever got an appeasement. These are credits. So Uber credits is a system, Uber employees get Uber credits, but if you ever get some sort of appeasement or you had a dispute on the price and, and you get your money back, you might get your money back immediately or you might get it as, as credits. And also in countries where people use cash, they can sometimes get credits in cases when there's no exact change available. Now, Uber credits is, is a beast behind the scenes, especially on the back end, but on mobile, I'm going to call it a large, maybe I'll call it a medium, but... I'll actually change that back to large. There's a lot of complexities there as well. A lot of different business logic, a lot of different regions that you need to care about. Now, all of what I've talked about here until now, it's just been payment. If I just circle this whole thing, this is payments. When we built it, it was about 20 engineers. And in terms of size, it, it must've translated to about 10 or 15% of the app. Maybe the size might have been overweight because of some of the SDKs that are here, the, the different ones. There's also credit card SDK. So this was just payments, which may account for 10 or 15% of the binary size, but in complexity, I'll, I'm gonna put it to maybe 10%. There's so many other parts of the Uber app, and this includes airport pickup. Every single airport has somewhat different layout, and you need to navigate people to tell them where to go, and there's so many different types of flows that the client needs to support even before the backend sends that data. And there's scheduled rides, which also gets pretty complex. Uh, I know because we work with them with the payments integration and it's not just a simple picker. There's different UI elements that you need to show in different parts of the app. There's things like commuter benefits in the US when you have that benefit card, there's rules of when you can use it and when you cannot. Obviously there's a backing component, but on the mobile side, you also wanna have some pre preliminary checks. The product type selector. So when you see the different types of cars or transit options you can have, there's a bunch of them and they just keep on growing and they have special characteristics that you need to account for on the client side to have different configurations on how you can do these things. Uber for business, now that's a beast. If you use Uber for business, there's a lot of different flows that are on the client itself from things like adding your different credit cards to how you integrate with your expensing tools, getting your receipts and so on. Uber for family, uh, adding family members, managing them and so on. The safety toolkit, if you're ever on a ride, you might see the safety toolkit pop up because it's regional. In some parts of the US, it's a lot more advanced than let's say some parts of Asia potentially, and this is depending on how the team will roll it out. But there's a lot of different features that have to have client-side integration. For example, to show you which number to dial, uh, for example, 911 or, or something else. And that needs to work offline. So that data needs to be preloaded onto the app for all regions. Fraud touch points. You might not think about it because you're an honest, legit user, but the app might detect that oh, there's something suspicious going on. And you might need to do things like take a photo of your card or of your ID or of yourself. There's a bunch of functionality that's shipped in the app, which you're probably never gonna see, but it lives there. And again, I know because we, as a payments team, we worked a lot with the Froth team and they have a bunch of stuff in the binary shipped worldwide. Receipts, you might not think too much of it, but especially if you're a business user, you need those receipts. There's some client side logic, not too much, but it's, it's still, again, because of all the different countries, it, it accounts for some. Customer support, 
Have you ever had a problem with your Uber? Well, you can cl complain in the app and you can have messages go back and forth in the app. Some code there as well for that. Lime or jump integration. Now, jump is no longer a thing, unfortunately, but Lime is still there. If you're in an area where you can get scooters or bikes, it shows up in the app. Guess what? There's a bunch of code shipped to make that happen. Uber Transit a new line of business in some cities you can actually see how you can get from a to b using transit options again a bunch of client side logic is in the app to support that and the eats integration you might notice that the uber app is becoming a bit more of more of a super app so eats is part of it you can just place eats orders and there's a bunch of code to make that happen and then there's other stuff that I probably don't even know about. So this was the stuff that I knew about because I worked on payments and we touched a lot of the different flows, but there will be some more. All right, I'll add a few more things. So if you were to open the source code and look around, you'd see some other components. Specifically, you see some shared components that everyone uses. Now this includes the ribs architecture that we're building everything based off, but it also includes shared code, like the networking code. There's a networking library that everyone uses that has a bunch of functionality to handle things like offline situations and get some reporting as well. Analytics uh, events and the analytics framework that the different components use to send analytics back to the back end. Performance monitoring, just sampling and getting some data so that engineers can actually see what parts of the app are slow on what devices. There's a dedicated team for this actually at Uber. Experiments framework on how to get all the different experiments down from the back end to decide which parts of the app to show to you or not. If you had an employee built, which I used to have, obviously I could have not shown it here, but you can go into the experiments and you see thousands of experiments. I think it was like 3000 experiments that some of them were dead, some of them were alive, but you can trigger different parts of the app and you get very different experiences. There is a dedicated mobile experience team, which is a proper team of at least 10 people or more. It might be a lot more actually. And there's people who are looking at the size of the app and making sure that it's as small as it can be. And yes, you can probably bring the size down a little bit more by moving things to the back end, but then the user experience will suffer. All right, well, so I hope this was useful to get an understanding of why the app is so complex and complexity to bring the size. I hope I've been able to get across, but the, that the app is not just so big just because it's massive and people are doing silly stuff. It's big because it's really, really complex. I did not expect this complexity when I joined Uber. I was really surprised on why there were even 10 mobile engineers on a payment team. Why do we need that? And then I saw that there were not enough engineers to actually just do the work. We had to defer a bunch of payments functionality because we just didn't have the people to do it. So as closing, whenever you see something not making sense, try to look behind on what might be the reason. Usually a lot of these tech companies, there are smart people there. The reason Google employs tens of thousands of people is not because building a search box is hard. There's a lot of different functionality behind this. Same thing with Uber. It's not just about the app. And by the way, Uber has multiple apps and, and multiple lines of businesses and, and a bunch of things hidden behind the scene. But even for the app itself, I consider it a pretty big deal that Uber was able to build an app that looks so simple. Most engineers I've talked to think that they could build the whole app in a weekend, at most a week. Well, yeah, give it a go. And then you'll see all the edge cases that outside of your main city, there, there's some other things that you need to take into account. That the driver app, which we've not talked about, is way more complex because drivers in every single state in the US have a different onboarding, for example, not to mention all the different countries and all the different requirements on all the different languages and all the different checks and so on. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more content on software engineering and engineering management. Thanks.